<laughs> in our current adventures. Um, so I think we're ready to plunge in if Zach has the images. And yeah. if you want to remember to mute yourselves during this in case you have a canine assistant or someone else wanting to add at your house. And then we can unmute at the end and, and do some questions. Right, so, and, and, and I, I, I possibly may get dropped off because of weak Wi-Fi. Um, I'm hoping that Carol will become the host and um, she'll be able to carry on. I'll pick up as quickly as possible, so just hang in there. But uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll make so it work. If we lose Zach, then we'll stop. we'll stop and have a conversation. If we lose Zach, and then he'll come back. He'll come back. Okay, that's All right. our plan. So I'm going to start sharing. Which one do I want? Give me a second to figure out where to put okay. this. I went on hold. Okay. Here we go. And again, if you're at home, just remember to mute until we get to our little conversation um, spot. Okay. And then we'll we'll be ready to plunge in. Okay. All right, so just remember to mute yourself if you're at home and then we'll open up for conversation later, okay? So we're gonna plunge right in. Um, George O'Keefe's first visual memory was of being placed on a patchwork quilt as a very, very small child. And she claims this was when she was under tiny red stars and the blocks of red and white flowers. And she said she remembered vividly the contrast between that quilt and the grass and her mother's friend's striking blonde hair. And I thought somehow this all seems perfect because the idea that those juxtapositions of nature and pattern would be George O'Keefe's first visual memories could not be something that you could have planned. It's absolute perfection. Next image, please. She is born in 1887 into a bustling family of seven kids in that very aptly named Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Uh, she's raised in a big rambling farmhouse filled with siblings and visiting relatives and friends and even the, the local uh, school teacher boarded with them as well. Um, the, the siblings were all apparently really intriguing folks and irrepressible individualists. Uh, bright and curious and independent and strong and encouraged by a very supportive mother and an army of very impressive aunts. And I was very intrigued that many of the aunts were professional women and all but one of the sisters in the family also became professional women as well. She adores her siblings, but was just as happy to exploring fields and meadows by herself. And intriguingly too, I have to say, she must have had an extraordinary mother who very early on thought um, that she needed art lessons. So she would actually employ a neighbor to teach Georgia and her sisters uh, to draw. And this was so clearly a piece of who she was that by middle school, uh, when another student asked her what she wanted to be, she would say without a hesitation that she was going to be an artist. Again, a middle schooler in the late 19th century. She adored drawing. And although her teachers were encouraging, we're gonna to go to the next image. They were often kind of puzzled by her approach and her vision to the art. She was just uh, far more abstract in many ways than her teachers. She told the story of one teacher she didn't like at all who held up in the class, uh, Jack in the Pulpit. And this is a much later image of O'Keefe's of Jack in the Pulpit. And she said for the first time she was struck, O'Keefe was struck by 
the, the, this flower, the dark inky colors and the subtle transitions in tone and these very, very sensual curving forms. And she thought very, very closely and carefully about looking at flowers, which of course she would do much later in life. This was all, O'Keefe said, a bit annoying uh, because again, she hated the teacher, but as she said, she may have started me looking at things, looking very carefully at a time when it was very, very unusual for women to pursue careers as professional artists. And we're gonna look at the next one now. She attends in 1905, the Art Institute of Chicago. And later she goes to the New York Art Students League and the Columbia Teachers College. And you know, generally she's intrigued and energized by her studies. And she loves professors, the likes of William Merritt Chase, who's a very, very well-known artist of the time. But again, always this core of independence, she said she wasn't interested in, and this is her quote, being taught to paint like someone else. Um, the whole idea of academic drills of uh, looking at uh, casts of Greek and Roman pieces and drawing from them, she thought this could not be more stultifying or boring for her. Um, next image. Later though, she would find an inspiration in the teaching and the mentorship of Arthur. Mm. He's interested in, uh, well, he's really a pioneer in American modernism. Asian influences are very much a part of his work, thinking about negative shapes. And more than anything, the big influence on her is abstractions, abstractions from nature and the rhythms of nature. So Tao becomes a huge and important influence on George O'Keefe's life and her work. Um, next image, please. In between her studies and very, very much as a result of her family's uncertain finances, um, up and down, and her father's house was up and down as well, she would then stop out of school and teach. And she worked as an art teacher. She worked as an art teacher in South Carolina and Columbia. She works as an art teacher uh, for different stints in Texas and Amarillo and Canyon. And I cannot imagine, this is a, an image from uh, the Texas days of being an art teacher. And in that very, very distinctive plain black dress and her sturdy little hiking boots with what looked like a very serious grave look that could easily break into a smile as well. And she was shocking because she just was not the norm in any way, shape or form. Not just her appearance, but her behavior as well. In one town, apparently she ran to the room and then immediately took down all the curtains. And of course people thought, well, this mm -hmm. is rather peculiar, but she wanted that light. She wanted the light so she could work on her, her own um, drawings and her own paintings. Also a bit unusual, I think for turn of the century, Texas, um, instead of attending as, I'm sure all folks would have a uh, religious service or being with a faith community on a Sunday morning. She wanted to know part of that. Sundays were spent hiking and exploring nature. So I'm sure she was, to put it politely, a puzzle to many in the communities. As a teacher, she was really frustrated with this kind of stiff, old fashioned 19th century approach. And again, she had these drawing textbooks and she thought, this is nothing I wanna deal with. She apparently was never condescending uh, to, to her students, but kind of clashed with the administration who wanted her to toe the line. She thought art would be, and this is, a, I think, very revolutionary for today, not for today, but then she said, art should be taught as a way of seeing. And she wanted her students to look at the environment around them and draw from what they saw, not draw from the, you know, plaster cast of, uh, you know, the Discobolus or something from ancient Greece or Rome, but she wanted them to look at their environment, to look at things like pebbles and ragweed and bleached skulls and actually draw from this. And again, doesn't sound shocking today, but that was a very, very different way to approach an art class in say 1916. 
Um, next image, please. Even more than the teaching uh, during these stints in Texas of teaching in a canyon in Amarillo, she really fell in love, not just with, again, students and the act of, of being an educator, but she really fell in love with the land. She looked at, this is another landscape from that time period. She was in love with the forms, the color, the light, the energy. Um, she wrote, I didn't even mind the dust. I didn't even mind the dust. She adored the kind of flat brown land, the incredible kaleidoscopic sunrises. And for the rest of her life, this area um, would really be the plains would be what she would consider, what she would call her spiritual home. She said, that was my country, the terrible winds and a wonderful emptiness. I love that quote, the terrible winds and a wonderful emptiness. Uh, next image, please. This is another, another, again, these are 1916, 1917. Uh, that they, they still are fresh and they're really a bit shocking too. Um, one of her very dearest friends and a constant correspondent uh, whenever she was away from the city was a fellow artist, a woman named Anita Pollitzer. And Pollitzer described O'Keefe, as a wonderful quote, as direct as an arrow and hugely independent, direct as an arrow. They shared so much. They shared a love of music. They shared excitement about new ideas and art. And they both wanted to keep up with whatever was the latest in the New York City art scene and gallery scene. And they shared a deep enthusiasm for the women's suffrage movement at the time too. Um, next image, please. When O'Keefe was teaching in South Carolina, it was only natural that she would be writing back and forth to her friend. And sometimes this was about personal things and you know who they were dating, this kind of thing. Other times it was, well, this is what I'm trying. This is what I'm thinking about in the studio. What do you think about this? So, Believe it or not, she, George O'Keefe would roll up a set of drawings, which she did. This is one of the drawings. Very, very free, very, very abstract uh, images inspired by nature. She would roll up a tube of them, as she did in 1916, and she sent them back to her friend uh, for her responses. And this is one of those images. When Pollitzer unrolled the drawings, she said she was struck by their aliveness. Uh, and this is again, Pollitzer speaking. She said, these drawings were saying something that had not yet been said. Mm -hmm. So her friend was so excited that she rolled those drawings. Again, these are charcoal pieces right back up in the tube and marches down to Alfred Stieglitz's gallery, 291. Um, Stieglitz takes them out of the tube, spreads them out on the floor of the gallery and carefully and silently studies says, he said, at last, a woman on paper. They were, he said, the purest, finest, sincerest things that have entered 291 in some time. So, and obviously the rest is history as they, uh, these drawings spark a relationship between George O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz. Next image, please. In 1916, when those drawings were sent to Stieglitz, he was in his 50s. Um, and of course she was uh, much younger, 24 years younger. And he was already a huge force in the art world. Um, he was uh, undoubtedly a very famous photographer in his own right. He was a passionate champion of modern artists. His gallery would have been the place if you wanted to go see a show of Picasso or Rodin, you would have gone to the Stieglitz, his gallery. And he was a huge booster of American modernism, people like Mars Nahart. And had an important journal called Camera Work. And again, you know, he was the owner of this, this gallery, 291. It was the cutting edge of modern art. So he was, he was a really important figure. And for him to take an interest in your artwork, that would have been 
game changing. And it was for George O'Keefe. Um, you are probably familiar with some of his most famous and iconic photographs. Next image, please. I'm guessing you all know um, this next image, it, the steerage. Probably folks have seen this piece. Um, very, very important. Um, you know, one of the kind of key works in studying art history of photography. Um, the next image, uh, another key iconic work is the flat iron mm -hmm. building. Okay, I'm sure many of you know these. Um, again, he is, is such an influential figure as an artist, as a promoter, as a gallery owner, and as a writer. He doesn't really have a Stieglitz uh, took the drawings that O'Keefe had sent to Pollitzer and she had shown him, and this is fascinating, it wouldn't happen today like this, but he took them and he actually hung them up in his gallery without George O'Keefe's permission. Mm -hmm. She came to New York and was justifiably annoyed and furious that he would take those liberties and not ask her permission to display them, but he does. And of course he wins her over in more ways than one. Um, they almost immediately become a, a, a couple. He is 54, she is 30. And they fairly quickly become um, engaged and uh, well, they become lovers, they become partners. Eventually he divorces his wife and they marry, but this is all brought about by these drawings. Next image, please. He chronicles his passion for George O'Keefe and his, his own photographs of her. He takes over 300 photographs of O'Keefe and they are so, so different. If we look at this one, it's so dramatic with the black hat and the kind of the cape across her, 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 her chest and her shoulders. They're very different. Some are full figure, some are isolated body parts. Uh, so there might just be a focus on her torso or her breasts or you know, her hands. Um, some are very intimate and more sensual and erotic nudes but they're so, so different. Um, and they're, I think, very, very fascinating. O'Keefe wrote that Stieglitz's idea of a portrait was not just one picture, a composite for a personality far too large to fit into one image. He just said, you're, you're much too big for one portrait. So uh, in his case, it needed to be at least 300 <laughs> next image. And these are, of course, her hands. Um, he believed that portraiture, and this is a very new and I think modern idea too. He believed that portraiture concerned much more than merely the face. Um, it should be, and these are his words, a record of a person's entire experience, a mosaic of movements. That's a nice phrase, a mosaic of movements and gestures that evoke a whole life. And what could be, I think, more evocative than seeing George O'Keefe's hands? Um, he said, to demand that a portrait will be a complete portrait of any person is as futile as to demand that a motion picture be condensed into a single image. I thought that is a very nice analogy, I think. And it tells you something about his 300 part portrait <laughs> of George O'Keefe. Almost immediately after that encounter over the drawings, and uh, he was married at the time, would later uh, you know, get divorced and, and marry O'Keefe, but they fell into a, a pattern pretty quickly of living in the city, in New York City, most of the year and spending summers in Lake George. Uh, next image, please. Although it may be the last place you would ever associate with George O'Keefe. She paints multiple images of New York City from a 30th floor apartment. Um, next image, this painting, New York with Moon, is her very first painting of New York City. She wrote, you, one can't paint New York as it is, but rather as it is felt, as it is felt. 
look at the simplified forms here and this odd low angle that's a bit claustrophobic, um, looks a little bit like a precisionist painting, but there's also something about it that looks a little surreal as well. I want you to look at the form of the street light and then that interesting halo around the street light. And then this tiny little piece of the moon that peeks out from the, those rippling uh, clouds. It's really fascinating. And that nature exists, but boy, you're really hemmed in by the buildings and the skyscrapers. And I love this repetition of these uh, circular forms that seem to have little halos around them, whether it be the red stoplight or the street light or the moon itself. Um, kind of fascinating. Next image, please. This is. O'Keeffe's depiction of the radiator building, a skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan. It is lit here from within and without. And we also have that low point of view that gives us a, a sense of awe. Those round street lamps, again, uh, giving us another sense of a pattern in the diagonal beam from a spotlight, adding a, a sense of movement to the piece. And I don't know if you can see, to me, the steam rising off the building on the right looks a lot like those cloud ripples that we just saw in the previous piece. And that mix of uh, a, a tiny bit of nature here, but really geometry, geometry, the built environment, and those strong geometric forms of the light beams are so interesting. And can you see in red what's on the left? In neon lights, and neon is a fairly recent innovation here, but she has put in neon, in red neon, she put Stieglitz's name. Uh, see that? Mm -hmm. uh. So in many ways, she has created something of a very unconventional portrait of him. He is doing very unconventional portraits of her and she's returning the favor in putting him in this and making him literally a skyscraper, this towering urban presence with his name and lights. So this is a really interesting approach too and uh, fascinating one. This is just called the radiator, radiator building. Uh, next image, please. The summers, as I mentioned, were spent at Lake George. And this was the the location of the Stieglitz summer house. It too would be filled uh, with people in the summers, family and friends and other artists coming and visitors. And she didn't care for it at all. She needed time and space and quiet to do her work. She did not want to be entertaining everybody's relatives. And, you know, again, didn't really care for the, the, the energy of lots of summer company. Um, and the landscape too, something ironically that I think we all love this landscape of New York State. She did not. She said it was, quote, too green and far too many trees. So this was the opposite of the plains landscape that really drew her excited and inspired her. Upstate New York, mm, not, not a thing for her. not a thing. She began at Lake George um, focusing not on the landscape, but on very, very individual uh, elements of nature like flowers. So this is next image where she begins this experimentation. Stieglitz was shocked. And I think you'll find that each time she's pushing him a little bit further. And he, although he is the, you know, very cutting edge artist and gallery owner, but she still pushes him. He says to her about the flower paintings, how are you gonna get away with this? You know, doesn't think this will work. What she does of course is enlarge the petals far beyond life-size proportions. And she forces the viewer to observe very, very small details that we just would not see in a flower. She wants us to really look at the forms, at the shapes, at the changes in tone and color. And she wants it to go beyond the canvas. So, you know, she's cropping the image, but the image goes far beyond this. 
So she, she gives us a whole new view. Flowers have been painted forever, but not painted like this. Oh, Keith said, nobody sees a flower. Really, it is so small. We haven't time. And to see takes time. Like to have a friend takes time. I'll paint it big and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it. I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. So she forces us into a new space that we just haven't occupied. Traditionally for hundreds of years, people have painted still lifes, but always at a scale that is realistic, never in a scale like this, never. Next image, please. Next one is a red poppy. Ooh. Again, so large, it does not fit on the large canvas. It's just popping off. Um, she actually puts us in the flower. Uh, we almost have an insect's point of view of actually going in and looking at the structures of the flower and looking at these subtle changes in color too that you just think, oh, it's orange, but it's not orange. There are parts that are yellow and darker orange and lighter orange um, and parts you know, edging into black at the, the base of those petals. So until you really look at it, you, you don't see it, you don't see it. Uh, next image, please. She specializes, this one is Jimson weed, in the extraordinary beauty that we simply overlook uh, because we're just too busy to see and we're too busy to stop. O'Keefe says, when you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for a moment. And she makes us stop and she makes us look in a way that artists just certainly had never approached this subject in the same way before this. Next image, please. During her teaching stints in Texas, O'Keefe had, and this is of course a much later image of her, she'd fallen in love with the plains and she took the first of many, many trips to New Mexico in 1929. She would eventually, after Stieglitz's death, move there permanently in the late 40s, and that would become her, her base of operations for the rest of her life. But she knew in as early as 1916 that this is the landscape she loved, the landscape that inspired her. And I think she hesitated because he so wanted her to be at Lake George in the summer, she hesitated to do it. But as soon as she took the first trip in 1929, every summer, she did the same thing. She did not stay at Lake George anymore. And I don't, I think that pained him, but that's what she needed to continue her work. Next image, please. This image is called the Lawrence tree. And it was inspired by a ponderosa pine on the New Mexico ranch of uh, the writer D.H. Lawrence. And she told a fascinating story that there was a carpenter's bench at the base of this tree and that she loved nothing more than lying on that carpenter's bench on her back, looking up through the branches of this massive pine tree at the night sky. And the perspective of this painting, which if you don't know that piece, seems a bit uh, surreal and unusual, is from the perspective of we are on that bench, um, on our back, looking along that tree and it almost seems like tentacles, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can't really even completely understand the image, but that's, that is the inspiration. So that perspective is O'Keefe on this bench, looking up at these, uh, again, almost octopus-like uh, forms of the branches and then the fuzzy kind of needle forms and then the, the, the sky. Our eye travels up the trunk to meet the stars of that sky that seem to go on forever. And it's it cropped also in an unusual way. Um, fascinating. Next image, please. This piece is also really early from her, from 1929, from those first. Uh, she encountered these crosses that were, that seemed to be erected near remote uh, chapels and she painted the crosses quite frequently. Um, she said, I painted it just as I saw it, big and strong and put together with wooden pegs. Um, Meg 
unifying the shapes and really simplifying the details. But just as with the flowers um, and with the, the um, uh, ponderosa pine we just saw, the perspective is it puts us across the image. Look at the way a simple gold band and red band. Um, and then the hills, look at the simplified forms of the hills. The hills go on and on. In her words, looking like, <laughs> looking, like looking out at two miles of gray elephants. <laughs> it's so simple. But what's unusual here is not just um, the way she treats the forms and the color, but I think it's the perspective. And as a viewer, where she puts us in the landscape, which is often in it, in it, whether we're looking up through the tree or right in the flower or here, right on top of this cross. And then that's framing this, this landscape. I don't know, nothing quite like it. Next image, please. One of her favorite subjects was an 18th century St. Francis. Okay, we're gonna look at the next one now. Let's see if it's, oh, there we go. Okay, and this is a photograph of that, of that church. Um, she, oh, okay, we're good. Um, she depicts the site as a kind of a, a cluster of rocky forms. And you'll see that this doesn't really look like a building. It looks like it's growing straight out of the soil. That boundary between the earth and the built form between the natural piece and the man-made because they all seem to be of a piece. She loved to show the viewer this church, but not from the front of the church. She didn't want you to see that entrance. She wanted you to see these square kind of abstract forms uh, from the back, from the rear of the church and merging the, the kind of the contours within the landscape and the sky. What's fascinating is for her, the church seems to be part of the actual landscape, literally, um, it seems to kind of grow right out of it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting approach. Uh, next image, please. Many of her works were focused on bones. Almost like uh, relics. For O'Keefe, the bones didn't evoke death, didn't suggest death but instead the actually shipped barrels of these bones back to New York City mm. to work with in her studio. And of course, Stieglitz was puzzled by this, but she knew she needed to work with this material. So she actually had them shipped back to the East Coast. This piece in particular focuses on that skull and and the textures, the composition, also this red, white, and blue theme, which at the time she said was really for her poking fun at all of the people who were trying to define what it meant to have an American painting, an American painting style. So she very intentionally uh, decided to put it, the skull against red, white, and blue. Next image, please. After Stieglitz's death in the 1940s, she would eventually go on to move permanently uh, to this area to buy property near Abiquiu and make her home permanently at the Ghost Ranch and work for the rest of her life. And she lived, I think, well into her 90s, um, finding inspiration in the Southwest. Um, love this her at her, her ease late in life. Next image, please. The next one is the cliffs beyond Abiquiu which reminds me very much of the, of the little church that we just saw. There's a sense that the landscape just goes right into the, 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 the stony forms seem to go right into the sky. And even as we saw earlier, the built landscape seems to just combine uh, immediately with the environment around it. Um, for the rest of her life, O'Keefe would repeat and kind of, I suppose, infinite variation on a theme 
of the same ideas, abstracted forms that are inspired by nature. The very same things that she claims captivated her as a toddler looking at that quilt and the world around it. This, I think, next image can be also be said of a very, very late work in her life, Sky Above Clouds, massive piece, 23 feet by, by eight feet. That's what fascinates her and that's what drives her from very, very early on to the end of her career. She's still thinking about these forms, whether it's a monumental piece like this or the next image or something much, much more intimate like Pink Hills um, that is again a very, very sensual and simple and abstract image that is in the Johnson's collection. That was part of the Nancy Green show, which I hope you saw pre-red alert uh, at the Johnson. So it can be both, but still the idea is the same. Um, in every case, uh, next image please, she really wants the viewer to do the same thing, to stop, to observe and to really focus on nature and its shapes and its forms and its patterns, to enter it and to explore it. This is her phrase, which I love, the wideness and the wonder of the world. So I thank you for joining me this morning and I'm happy to answer or I'll try, you know, this, this is just a teeny little sampler, teeny little sampler. She's got such a, an amazing body of work. Um, but this is just a, just an order, just an order. So if anybody has got something they want to ask or share, I wish we could be there in person and someday we will again. Someday. Does the Johnson have other paintings of hers besides that one? I just think it's just, I think it's just Pink Hills. I think it's just yeah. Pink Hills. There are quite a few um, Stieglitz images in the collection, though, and uh, so there is there is that, but not not of hers. And what were her most commercially successful paintings did, was there a period that she was huh that's a good question Priscilla. that's a really good question um it, it's fascinating because you know Stieglitz is both you know lover mentor gallery owner he's marketing her in a certain way that she doesn't really want to be marketed he's he's saying that aren't these sensual organic female forms and you know she doesn't seem to want him to approach it like that. I think she was quite successful in many ways. And I don't know that, that's a really good question. If one was more, I think pe seemed to, pe people seem to um, discover the flower paintings early on and like those. The New York City images, Stieglitz told her he didn't want her to exhibit. I think it was, I don't know if it was New York City with Moon or the Radiator Building that the very next year she did and it sold immediately. So it seemed like she had her you know, supporters early on. Um, but I don't know, that's a really good question, which were the most commercially successful. But I it's think he was quite interesting interesting because, Yeah, it's, they're so different. Like she has such different styles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, and the New York City approach is so, so different from uh, the Southwestern pieces. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm just curious because a couple of things seem kind of interesting and paradoxical in the fact that she grew up with this large family and yet it sounds like she was very much of an introvert in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I just imagine that for her, it must have been a lot of conflict to be Stieglitz's partner because he was such a city person and you know surrounded by people, and she seemed to be someone who liked to walk alone in the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it did seem like when a conflict, and it felt like 
at least in the tensions of their relationship. As soon as she discovers that first trip in 1929, you can feel her kind of pulling away and in their letters mm -hmm. back and forth, you know, you can feel that that's a very stressful thing and he's getting older, he's having more health issues, but I think she knows this is what I have to do for me. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be there during the summers. So you can feel that tension in their relationship. And at one point he becomes involved with somebody else and that really pushes her, uh, her mental health. Um, you know, so it's a complicated relationship, but you're right, very, very different. He is, you know, urban energy most of the year with the Lake George. And she was very, very happy, you know, just being in New Mexico and, and on the plains. So I think very different. And he seemed much more energized by people. Evidently when you'd walk in the gallery, he would buttonhole you and, you know, talk about the latest theories and ideas. And he was in some ways, not just an artist, but a real promoter and a sales person. And that That, that piece. And he had that uh, in abundance, pull people in and just talk their ear off about whatever was the, the latest trend or the, I think comfortable with that kind of promotion, but that's what he had to do. And he was very good at it too. And I don't think there's very many artists who could do both. You know, obviously he's a very accomplished artist but he was a very savvy writer and promoter of other people's art. So I, I'm sure there's very few people who could do that. Now, did she ever do desert flowers and plants? After she, because most of what I've ever seen was from the New Mexico days was the landscape instead mm -hmm. of the plants That's they're a good in. Question. No, I don't, I don't think of any desert flowers and plants. I think of that as primarily, again, those, you know, the poppies and the iris and the jack in the pulpit. Were, but actually, I mean, desert flowers don't bloom that mm -hmm. often, <laughs> you know, so that's part of the problem is that they don't bloom every mm -hmm. year. But, but, you know, I can't think, of, I don't think she did cactus or anything like that. Um, I think it seems like the, the, the forms of cliffs and the, again, the, those kinds of landscapes seem to are more important to her. Hmm. I mean, the flowers were some beautiful cactus flowers. It seems she went to the mega scale instead of the micro scale, I guess, in her later years. Yeah, and those jack in the pulpit. So she's got maybe three or four of the jack in the pulpit. And I think those are, I think the most some of the most powerful and the black iris as well. Pictures of cliffs and hills remind me of the buildings and the cityscapes. Well, th that's a good point, Jerry. You're right. They are very, yeah, th th there are connections between those. And I, I still can't get over her and, you know, painting skyscrapers, but obviously she did. She did. But you're right, very similar. Do you know the year that she painted that cityscape with Stagley, the name on the red? Um, I'm thinking that's got to be around late 20s. Um, hmm. I can look at my notes, but I think. Um, yeah, because that's a really intriguing piece in many ways. I think late 20s. Okay. My best estimate. Yeah, New York with Moon is her first painting of New York City, and I think the Radiator Building is not long after that. Do you know how big it was? The size? I don't. The because the thought of twenty a twenty two foot painting is pretty impressive. That you mentioned one of them was one of them. The only one I've seen that's massive is the second to the last painting that I showed you. The glass, right. and that's at the Art Institute in Chicago, and it is huge. But I can't think of anything else of that same scale that she ever did. But that one is 
yeah, it is, is very impressive. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing that, that I recall that she's ever done. Can I ask, is she more, has she become more popular now that she's passed or was she very popular when she was still alive? Oh, that's a good question. I think become much more popular after she has passed away. Um, I think um, I think she's just so iconic now. Yeah, and also yeah. like a you know her images are are just so well known. I so, yeah, okay. I think more popular. You think about a work like Judy Chicago's Dinner Party, where she's got iconic women seated at a table, and then she's got a setting for each woman. And what's interesting is she's got women from all different walks of life. She's got artists, writers, uh, women involved with faith communities, musicians. But it's interesting in that, I think it's 39 women at that dinner party. But the peak, the one woman that is the last woman in Judy Chicago's dinner party is George O'Keefe. And in, in her mind, and Judy Chicago, of course, one of the most important of the, the feminist artists, in her mind, you know, George O'Keefe would have been the peak of somebody who had a successful career on her own. Um, but yeah, I, th I think she just becomes more and more popular as, as the years go by. And I so think- I wonder what was, type of, how many, you know, who collected her paintings mostly? Were, did uh, Seigler's have a lot of her paintings or were they collected by many different people? That, that, that I don't know, that I don't know. I think you'd really have to look and see what's in major collections. Um, that I, I really don't know if there were particular museums who kind of knew that they wanted to collect her early on. I don't know if there, I assume there's a lot in the MoMA, but um, I don't really know who were the folks who were right on her immediately um, and where most of those works. Of course, you know, uh, the George O'Keefe Museum has, has yeah, a lot. I don't, I, don't, I don't know in terms of the other big museums if anybody has a big holding or if people just have one or two here or there. Thank you. In the chat, um, someone made the observation about her wearing a black hat in the early pictures and then later in life, she's photographed without it. And wondering if you think there's, um, does that symbolize a transition or something in her life? I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. It seemed like early on when you see her in the teens and the twenties, she's got a very, um, you know, you know, simple, uh, you know, again, simple black dress, these sturdy work boots. And she has a very, almost a, a Quaker, Quaker look um, in terms of simplicity. She did not, you know, didn't seem to have a kind of a, a more bohemian look. Um, and then when she goes to the Southwest, she has a very definite look there. Um, where you see again at that more again traditional hat that, that she was wearing in one of those images, um, and you'll see her with with jewelry that that you know maybe like a turquoise piece, something that seems to be more connected, and it feels like the teens and the twenties you see her in you know artsy black most of the time. The questions that you've got. No, I'm, I'm delighted to see you all one of these days. We'll really see each other. But until yeah, then, I you, hope Carol. we can still do this. Yes, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Stay, stay, stay safe. Stay well. All right. You too. Yes. All right. Thank Have you. Good holidays. We'll see you in January, I hope. All right. Look forward. All righty. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.